Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd like to apologize for reading this thing in English. But unfortunately, the theme sits here in English. And uh, that's the way it is. So my deepest apologies. And then my no less deep thanks to Professor Segal and to Dr. Rudnik for the invitation. And the entire short lecture is actually a tardy a lack correction of a wrong answer I once gave Professor Sermon 18 years ago. <laughs> Professor Sermon was kind enough to be on the jury of my doctoral thesis in Geneva. And I fondly remember how nice he was. And on the preceding evening of that uh, event, when I was very tense, he asked me whether there were any Hebrew translations of 18th century Russian literature into Hebrew. And me being younger and stupid, I answered immediately no, and there could be no such thing. And actually, in a sense, I'm not much smarter today, but I'm a little older, and I've discovered that I was completely wrong. Nonetheless, there is some, there was some truth in the immediate answer I threw at him because of the general deep anomaly of the tradition of poetry translation into Hebrew. Now anyone even slightly familiar with that tradition knows full well that what's absent from this tradition is about 100 fold more than what's there, right? Any, any occasional list of world classics that should be translated, not, not translated, transformed into a bibliography of Hebrew translations will hold many a blank page. Simply there will be nothing there. Now, it would be much too long to explain why is this so, but I'll try for a succinct version of why this is so. This is so, first of all, because the general idea of Judaism that is expressed already in one rather famous Talmudic pericope is that Jews have no time for such thing as reading secular literature at all. There is a famous perico, and I'll say it first in Hebrew, then try a lame translation into English. Okay. Comes someone to the sages and asks, sages, am I allowed to teach my son Greek wisdom? By Greek wisdom, what's meant is simply the Greek language. Okay? <laughs> Nothing else. The sages quote, it is written in the Holy Bible, thou shalt ponder the Holy Writ day and night. Find yourself an hour which is neither day nor night, and do whatever you want. Okay? Now, in general, the translation of modern poetry into Hebrew began somewhere around 1780. Unfortunately, for our tradition, the, great, the greatest intellectual leader of that time, and the greatest poet, according to his audience, Naftali Herzvezeli, wrote a document that was intended for future uh, young writers and translators. This was printed in Berlin in 1789, and there was a dictum that was harshly preserved for about four to five decades. And again, I quote in Hebrew, Beha'ata koteichem, shmot eililehem, 
ועצביהם לא תזכירו, כן? Meaning in your translations you will thoroughly omit the names of any heathen uh, idols, okay? Entities. Entities and idols. Atzabeihem, Reimuleihem. Now, this seems to be rather innocent, but it meant that every Hebrew translator was immediately, by dictum, excluded from the general Esperanto of European poetry, right? If any translator should meet in any text something like Pitomitz Apollona, he can only translate Pitomitz, okay? <laughs> but he cannot, he cannot use the name of Apollo anywhere. Now, the main enemies between inverted commas were Greek and Latin texts and Christian texts. With the Christian texts, though, there was a conundrum, okay? Some texts that can be dubbed as, between inverted commas, neutral, did find their way into Hebrew. And I have an example which amazes me and my colleagues in Hebrew literature, okay? Of course, no one could ever imagine a Hebrew translation of, let's say, the Stabat Mater Dolorosa or Pange Lingua, okay? <coughs> Great Christian hymns. But in Odessa, in 1869, we find a rather rare book today, which is actually a prestomity for young Karaite boys. Учебник древнееврейского языка для караимских школ составлен неким таким довольно известным караимским раввином Ильей Казизом, Илья Казаз. He studied in St. Petersburg. He was a very learned gentleman. And we find many biblical excerpts for reading and exercises. Then a very small anthology of, uh, of rather well-known, um, again, I have to translate, Presvititelski texty, maskilik, verse, and then we find a strange poem. Uh, I shall only read the three first lines and I'll see whether Professor Segal will identify the source, right? Yom Chaon Eima Vazam, Yom Anan Vaesh Varam, Yom Hayom Hayom Haba. Dies Ile, Dies Ila, Solvet Mondus in Fabila, except for Teste David Cum Sibila, which is out. <laughs> so the theme Dirjavin in Hebrew is a priori a non existent theme. Nonetheless, in the same city of Odessa, and I have to remind those who are not familiar with our literature, that by the year, let's say, 1880, this will become the most important center for Hebrew literature, but it was a non-negligible center already around the 1860s. In the history of Zionism, this is Mecca, okay? The main texts of Zionism were written between Rishelievskaya and whatever town, Neponyo, uh, you There were several there was very there was a big group of interesting figures living and working in Odessa among those there was the father of the founding father of Russian Zionism a man by the name of Simcha Pinsker okay and every Israeli knows Pinsker Street but this is the son not the father. The father was well known for being a great scholar on Karaite texts and the founding father of a school for Hebrew children, uh, for Jewish children, where some of the schooling was done in Hebrew, in Hebrew at that period. 
it was not a long-lived project, but it was there for about 35 years, as much as I know, on Rishulievsky, right? Uh, one of the teachers in that school was a man by the name of Eliyahu Mordechai Verbel. <coughs> Eliyahu Mordechai Verbel was at the time a, ve a relatively well-known poet. His main claim to fame was the first large romantic poem on a subject matter not taken from the Bible, but from general Talmudic literature. The first poem on a Talmudic subject. It has an unsavory title. I, I will only quote the title because retelling the poem will take a very long time. It's called Eidim uh, Neemanim Choldavavo, Tested Witnesses, a Rat and the Well. Okay? And I leave the mystery in that. Now, Mr. Verbal himself was a genuine product of the late Hebrew Enlightenment, meaning he was a student in one of the first modern Hebrew schools, if not the very first, founded in Tarnopil by the greatest satirical writer of the first third of the, of the 19th uh, century, Joseph Perl. He was his student, okay? Well, this, this was like being, I don't know, the first, the first uh, PhD of Harvard, okay, for Jews <laughs> at that time. And Vendel then moved to Odessa and stayed there as a teacher of Hebrew, okay? And now comes a very intricate, as it is always the case with Jews, a very intricate network of family ties. Verbel was the son-in-law of perhaps the greatest Jewish Yiddish playwright, Avon Goldfarb. Right? He was his son-in-law and a friend of another great poet and teacher of Hebrew from Galicia, Avraham Ber Gottlober. Okay? Gottlober is a name not, not all Hebrew scholars know of today, but to make a long story very short, for the history of Hebrew prosody, this man is continued with the Apostolic Lomonosov all in one, okay? Because he wrote in 1880, the first pamphlet or tractate about Hebrew prosody with the first time suggestion to move into syllabotonic uh, versification. In 1863, Verbil publishes in Odessa in a very well-known publishing house, that of Moshe Avum Bailinson, who printed many a Hebrew book in Odessa, a small, there are only 90 pages, a small booklet of poetry under the title taken from Psalm 73, Siftei Renanot, Chanting Lips. Okay? Now, the, I have no time to read you the whole introduction, but the introduction reads in 1863 like a pre a transhistoric front page of Druzh Banarodov. Okay? Translation writes Verbil is the safest way to befriend other nations. Okay? That's the first phrase. And then he tells a very touching story. The story is formulaic. For 30 years one poem gave me a, sh a cold shoulder. That poem is by the great Russian poet, Hameshorer Habusi Hamefoar, Gavriel Dirjanin. Okay? <laughs> Dirjanin, of course, is transcribed, as was the custom at that time. Hebrew had no way of transcribing Russian names, so it's transcribed in Yiddish. Dirjanin. Okay. <laughs> okay. And he says, for 30 years, 
I was trying to translate this poem and I couldn't do it. This in itself is a formula that has to do with the history of translation of foreign texts into Hebrew. Sometimes the formula is much larger. Okay? The kernel of the formula is this. This text is non-Jewish, and this is a great problem for me, a Jewish translator. In its fullest form, it will appear about 10 years later with the first version, the first Hebrew version of Faust, printed in Vienna, where the same phrase is repeated, but with an explanation. For 30 years, I was looking for the right way to make this a kosher Jewish text, right? And I hadn't found it until this day. In Gottlober's case, it's a little different. And this is corroborated, this is for Professor Timinch, okay? This is corroborated by Gottlober's memoirs in Yiddish, okay? Published 40 years later, Gottlober came to Odessa Verbal told him of his great project to translate Dzerzhavin's Bog, okay? Gottlober had itchy fingers, as they say, and then writes, Gottlober, Vatochazeni kinat sofrim, vaida kiba eit, yesh lasot zot ata, okay? And then I was taken by jealousy, and I decided I must finish the project immediately. Okay? There was a problem of a title. Okay? The title book is an impossible title in Hebrew. Okay? How to translate that? By the way, many a Hebrew translator had a problem with foreign titles. This time came to the rescue, and it's all written here, Simcha Pinsky who suggested the title, Hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. Wait, it's not the end of the story. Okay. <laughs> and Gottlober thanks him for this title and sets out to translate the Israelis book. And now I will briefly describe this translation. The general rule, as you must have understood, was that of absolute Judaization and expurgation of every such text. Everything that was impossible for Jews to read was simply omitted. Or, in other cases, greatly augmented. The first translation of Hermann und Dorothea into Hebrew is four times larger than the original, okay? because of many interesting biblical quotations that were chained <laughs> along the translation, okay? Other texts, such as the Dies Irae, became a very small poem, whereas Thomas de Celano's hymn is 16 stanzas, okay? This little poem is about six stanzas. What's remarkable about this translation is that it has the same amount of stanzas and nothing is omitted, okay? On the formal level, this is an astounding achievement, okay? I shall give only two or three examples for the benefit of those who do understand the Hebrew. Alas, that's all I can do. As you all remember, in the Arjavin's text, the word Bob is at the very end of the first stanza, okay? Again, a general rule in old translations. The rhyme schemes moves backwards. All the key words will be found in other positions along the line, not in their original position. Okay? I once gave this as a good advice to modern translators of Pushkin. I looked at some of their translations, and I said there is not even one rhyme here that's in the original. Everything moved elsewhere in your translation. You better put it back to its place. Gottlober managed, okay? The first stanza, I'm reading it. Gadol bashchakim ad bilti rakia chayatcha berikshat kol hayekum rocheshet shetefaiti met nitzchachayabia 
אחד קדוש בקדושה המשולשת, יחיד מבלי מקום בכל נמצאת, קדמון מאז מעולם לא נבראת, נשגב מהסיד, מהבין גבוה, תבל ומלאה נפשך תמלאנו, תכיל אותם, חוללתם ותעודדנו, פי אדם יקרא שמך אלוה. Now, already in this one, in this first stanza is the whole trick. The Hebrew reader is sent pulses, linguistic pulses, that connect this text to previous Jewish traditions. And not only biblical. The biblical tradition is underlined by the archaisms, current in Enlightenment Hebrew poetry, Timlaemo, Teodedemo, which are archaisms already in the books of Psalms, instead of Timlaem, Teodedem. Now, how would the Hebrew translator translating this text cope with the line, you, the Almighty, who are the Trinity? What do you do with that? Okay? Dr. was an intelligent Jew. El Kadosh, Echad Kadosh, Bikdusha Meshuleshet. Okay? It's The Saint God in tri Triple Sanctity. The Jewish reader, of course, thinks of Isaiah 6, Three, Srafim Koreim, Kadosh, 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 Rokol Aretz Kvodo. And there is no problem anymore. Okay? <laughs> Now, to be a little bit more serious, the real tradition, this text, is <coughs> linking itself to are the philosophical, deistic poems that stem from Ibn Gabirol's Keter Malchut, the crown of glory by Ibn Gabirol. The language I have no time to demonstrate, and the demonstration will be tiresome, so please do trust me, okay? All the theological terminology goes back to the Book of Psalms, to Ibn Gabirol, and a third element, because there is a third problem, Hebrew literature at that time does not recognize the ode as a genre. Okay? To this I will come in a moment. They don't know what an ode is. It doesn't even have a Hebrew name. Okay? But there was one writer of odes. There were actually two. I'm lying a little. But the greatest writer of odes was the same Naftali Herz Weisel. Okay? in his epic Shirei Tiferet, Songs of Glory, the first epic in modern Hebrew. Each of the 18 books of that epic is opened by a Duchovne Istichi, a, a Duchovne Aoda, and the structure is Wiesel's. Now, everything I told you did not escape the scrutiny of readers. Okay. We have, again, a very nice testimony, if I can only find it, yes, I can, that the title, Hallelujah, and the solution of the Trinitarian God were dubious for many readers. Again, from Professor Dimenci, Yakapalsia Dolga, there was a an extremely rare one-time publication in Odessa, two years after the publication of Verbel's translation, of a one-time journal in four parts that appeared never again by the name of Alei Hadas, okay? Myrtle Leaves. And there, the same of Aham, there, Dotlober, printed an open letter to Mr. Verbil, okay? where he wrote something that became later again a formula in 
theoretical writings about translation in Hebrew. I shall read it to you. I read, I read your wonderful book. The poem Hallelujah is a, one of the greatest Hebrew poems ever to be written. I am sure that had Jerusalem resurrected from his grave, he would say, this is an original poem by Verbi, <laughs> not mine, okay? So that you don't think that I'm pulling your leg. Moshe Amarti, she'im yakum dirjavin ve'yikre'ehu, yomar ivrihu mileida, yotze yelech Verbi, lo sholim, okay? But there is a debate around the title. It says the title, Hallelujah, is the wrong title because hallelujah is only found within Psalms as an opening or an ending in okay? Therefore, I suggest, and he sent this letter to two other editorial boards of Hebrew periodicals of the time, suggesting to change the title and to call it on the basis of another verse in Psalm 72, Chasim and not Hallelujah. Okay? Now, to conclude, this may seem as an isolated, interesting, finding episode, okay? Four guys in Odessa met, translated, published, and that was the end of the story. Well, no, it wasn't. Still, I have to answer the question, what could a Hebrew reader know of Dirjadin prior to, let's say, 1950, okay? Where there were already some histories of Russian literature written in Hebrew. Well, in 1875, a book was published. It was a commission job, okay? Given to a very well-known at that time, poet, well, he wasn't known for his poetry, scholar of Semitic languages who studied under Huelson, okay? and the author of the best until that time and for several decades more, Concordance to the Bible, Dr. Shlomo Mandelke. Okay? In many Israeli houses, you could still find, until not many years ago, this huge infolio called Heichal Shlomo, the Temple of Solomon, uh, which was the title of this concordance. This was Shlomo Mandelkin. And he wrote a book, Historia Resi, okay, planned in three parts, only two appeared, okay, and by the end of the second volume, there is again, you believe me, a very decent uh, descript well, a very decent report about Russian literature, basically Russian poetry, beginning with Feofan Pratapovich and Antioch Antimir, ending with uh, Novikov. Okay? It is 40 pages long. The book was read because it was compulsory reading in some circles. And there are about 10 pages devoted to Dzerzhavin. And a note, the best Hebrew translation is by Mr. Verbil. I think that's enough. Thank you.